So theme today is to talk about what options we have when a patient gets diagnosed with prostate cancer. It's obvious there is no other cancer which can have such a diverse presentation. So the one of the critical understanding about prostate cancer is we as a doctor and you all as a patient need to understand the differentiation between the different kinds of cancers. And that's where a good understanding of the risk assessment comes. So not every cancer is same, not my brother's cancer is the same as my cancer. My uncle's cancer is not my cancer. It is different and we need to identify the kind and the extent. Extent is what we call the staging. That cancer is within the orange or is it trying to come outside the peel? That's the staging discussion happens. When you focus on the cancer which is curable and you are talking about what you call a whole gland treatment. And you will realize that majority of the patients ultimately will need either watchful waiting or the whole gland treatment. And in between comes the focal therapy discussion. So we will have a session on the focal therapy next time, just dedicating only to the focal therapy. What are the different kinds? What are the different modalities? How, how to select the patient? But today I'm going to focus on a very in-depth discussion between the two experts what are the pros and cons of radiation versus a radical prostatectomy and the radical prostatectomy could be of many different kinds we now have a nerve sparing radical prostatectomy we have different approaches towards the radical prostatectomy we have different grades of nerve sparing discussion and i'm not going to go into that today because you cannot cover everything in the same day we will have a discussion on those things later. Today, you will learn a lot about who is an ideal candidate for radiation. What are the different kinds of radiation? Radiation can be given from an outside in, and that is known as a beam therapy, and that can be delivered in three different ways. One is when it's compressed shortly, we call it as a cyber knife. When it is given over time, we call it IMRT. When we give a different kind of radiation, we call it proton beam. When we give the radiation from inside out, we call it brachytherapy or seeds. They are all radiation, but controlled by an expert and a technician and an equipment that it only delivers to that bad cell which is there and how to avoid involvement of the surrounding structures. That is where the nuance comes in. That's where the science becomes an art. So you will learn a little bit about that. What are the pros and cons? And then some of my colleagues will talk about what actually surgically can be treated, what is the long-term implications. And one important thing all of you need to know that in medicine, when we talk about this versus that modality, usually that data comes out of a trial, which we call a randomized trial. By randomized trial, it means that they were 500 or a thousand patients who were of identical kind. And at the time of the treatment, they signed up for a research in which they got this treatment versus that treatment without anything from them at that time, once they have decided to participate in the research. And that is the cleanest and the purest form of an outcome. We can say that you randomize the patient between one treatment versus other. Then you followed them up for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. And then you look at what happened to those patients. This is one way of looking at the data when you compare the two different modalities. Unfortunately, there are not many or there are not even one really meaningful randomized study between radiation versus surgery. So most of the time when we talk about one modality versus other, we talk about our gut feelings, our experiences, our follow-up of the patients over the last 10, 20 years. I was lucky to be working with Dr. Menon at Henry Ford in between 96 to year 2000. Up to 2004, I was there. And I had a luxury of working in a cancer center where there was a lot of automated data. And I got an access to about a couple of thousand, four or 5,000 patients' data who either had a watchful waiting or had a radiation and or had a 
what you call surgical treatment. And I could follow them up for 10 years, 20 years. That laid down the foundation in my mind as to who is a good candidate for what treatment. But I'm not going to implant that seed in your mind now. I have experts talking about why someone should have radiation, why someone should have surgery, and there will be differences of opinion. And I want to deliberately bring it out by, for the discussion. Dr. Bobby Liao will give a perspective because he's a medical oncologist. He sees patients on the both the sides. When surgical patients get problem, he's the one tackling it. When the radiation patients get problem, he's the one who's tackling it. So he is the moderator in between this with a very independent perspective. And Dr. Menon is going to give a little different part of the equation because he in the last few years have been very much involved with the patient's aspect of the decision making. What may be important to Mr. Smith may not be important to Mr. Lewis. Someone at the age of 43 year may care more about sexual function than someone at the age of 67 whose Gleason is nine. It's very independent, different. So there is a science which is evolving in as to how people make an assessment. For someone, stock price is going up rapidly, maybe a great thing, someone doesn't want to deal with it. So when the human mind is dealing with these questions, it's a very complex process. So Dr. Menes is studying that and he will present his perspective about how the decision-making is going on. And as you can see, I don't have any slides. I just wanted to kind of connect with you. I will listen to any other advice you guys have for the next time what to talk about. It will be in the next six weeks. We'll have another session, possibly during our major, major symposium. We can have it. But I'm thinking about a major session on the focal therapy, which will be the next time. Bobby, I want you to start the process. And then either Stuart will start. And Peter is, is still in the OR. So that's OK. Come on. All righty. Well, um, I think Dr. Tawari kind of put things in a little bit of perspective in that, uh, you know, as a medical oncologist, I, I kind of find myself in like a neutral ground. Uh, I don't do surgery. I don't do radiation therapy. And so I think uh, I try to make sure that we have some equipoise trying to like understand like, you know, where data lies on each side to help make decisions. And I think um, as we kind of get on with the program a little bit later, you'll, you'll start to hear like, you know, different things um, in terms of like surgery, different things in terms of radiation therapy. But um, I, I'll start off with like this, like, you know, kind of like an odd comment, which is that the, the optimal management of prostate cancer is of localized, like newly diagnosed prostate cancer. It still remains somewhat controversial. Uh, as Dr. Twyre said, like, you know, we don't have any like large randomized phase three trial to guide us like surgery versus radiation. And I unfortunately don't think that we'll ever have one. There's unfortunately going to be a little bit too much implicit bias. Um, I think, you know, um, a lot of respect for my colleagues, but, you know, I think the urologists are always going to be a little bit more pro-surgery. Radiation oncologists are gonna, always going to be a little bit pro-radiation. I think that's fair to say, right, guys? Um, and I, I don't think it's because like they're being weird and they just want to like you know like you know grow their business and like you know they want numbers. But I think in their core, they they really think that they're trying to help you. People believe in their craft, they believe in their skill set, they believe in what they can do for you. And and everyone I think is is you know on the same side. They're actually trying to help. But you know, in the absence of randomized clinical data to kind of tell one way versus the other, it's. It's, it's unfortunately, there's always going to be a little bit of bias based on how we want to read the data. Um, but I think um, both surgery and radiation are both, they, they, they've, they've stuck around for a long time because they're, they're very effective therapies. Um, and, um, you know, I start off by saying like the, the optimal management is somewhat controversial just because we don't have that one pure data point to lead us, but we have a lot of experience. And this is not just like looking at Mount Sinai, but this is looking the world over. Uh, and this is like, you know, taking into account, like, you know, how surgical techniques has improved over time. It's also taking into account how radiation techniques improved over time. And I would say like, you know, for the most part, the, the two kind of like, you know, uh, modalities of therapies are fairly neck and neck. 
this is not even getting into some of the other things that we sometimes can get into. Like Ash had brought up like, you know, focal therapy, cryotherapy, high, high intensity frequency ablation, you know, in certain cases, these are still good ideas. Um, but I think, you know, um, as we kind of hear from my colleagues about surgery, radiation, important to understand that, you know, uh, in the end, like, you know, a, like the finalized decision on how to proceed should be um, predicated on um, an informed discussion, understanding like the risks and benefit of each before a patient really should decide. And, and a lot of that decision should be guided. It shouldn't just be like, you know, here's your options, you should pick. Um, so I think maybe after we hear from, I'll talk a little bit about like, you know, what we should also be focusing on in terms of multidisciplinary input. Um, here at Mount Sinai, we have our own multidisciplinary prostate cancer clinic specifically for that purpose to kind of not have everyone just like get a bunch of like isolated opinions and try to put things together on their own, that this should be a, a joint effort. Uh, we should not ever make it sound like it's surgery versus radiation. It should be us as your doctors with you against the disease. Anytime that there's a new diagnosis, there's always a couple of like key pieces of information that we're looking for. And I think by extension, what you should be kind of paying attention to, but certainly like the type of prostate cancer, uh, you know, not all prostate cancer is equal. We have like kind of your low grade variety, the Gleason sixes of the world. And then you kind of, you know, as like the Gleason score goes higher, you go into intermediate risk and high risk disease. You know, Gleason scores goes anywhere from like six to 10, six is low risk, seven is intermediate risk, eight and above kind of qualifies as high risk disease. Um, another prognostic indicator that we often will kind of refer to is just like the PSA numbers at diagnosis. Um, it's an imperfect system, but, you know, it does give us a little bit of stratification for risk. You know, typically I tell folks like, you know, PSA 10 and below, it's kind of a little bit more associated with lower risk disease. 10 to 20 more intermediate, 20 and above, we start to get into more high risk territory, no matter what the Gleason score is. And lastly, staging is important because obviously like, you know, when there's like a new diagnosis, um, just the diagnosis alone doesn't tell us everything. We need to know where the disease, where the disease isn't. Uh, so oftentimes like this is why, like when we do scans, I mean, MRIs, you know, more and more we're like incorporating PET scan imaging into prostate cancer staging especially as PSMA PET scan imaging has been shown to be by far much more sensitive, much more specific for prostate cancer detection than our old school bone scan, CAT scan, the old standard imaging. So between staging and the type of disease, like, you know, low risk, intermediate, high risk, like, you know, we start to use that to kind of like make our assessments on, are we in a position to really go for cure, which is of course, like, you know, what the whole goal of screening for prostate cancer is like, we're trying to catch the disease in an early enough stage that we can go and get it and be done with it. Or if we are unfortunately in a position where there's disease that's unfortunately already spread outside the prostate to like more farther away parts of the body, like, you know, that, that our, our goal changes a little bit in the sense that, you know, once it has unfortunately metastasized, our, our main goal is to make sure that we optimize the control because even if we can't fully cure the disease, at least with our current, you know, medical advancements, we have not yet found a way to, you know, really guarantee cure for anyone with metastatic disease, but prostate cancer is a disease that we can have confidence that we have long-term control, years of control, but, you know, it's really important for us to understand, like, you know, how do we start the treatment? How do we optimize like the many different drugs that we have in order to get to like the most optimal long-term disease control? So there's a lot of things that kind of factor in there. We're kind of lucky here at Mount Sinai and that because this is like a very large institution and of course, like under the helm of Dr. Tori, like, you know, a very big program for prostate cancer. And so our pathologists are inundated with like, you know, different samples all the time. And, you know, that's important because it gives uh, it, they, they come from a place of a lot of experience because um, when, when we talk about Gleason score and like I mentioned, it, it's in, it's an important piece of information up front because it kind of like, you know, guides us as like, you know, how aggressive we need to be in terms of like, you know, uh, do we need to jump on this disease right away or is this something that we can safely watch? So it makes a difference in our assessment of risk and how we want to proceed with management. But the Gleason score, um, is, is basically, a, 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 it's, a, it's a numbered system 
that is fully kind of like, you know, come to by what the pathologist sees under the microscope. So um, in a, if a pathologist does not have quite like the same level of expertise or experience, their read of the Gleason score may be very different from what like a, like a, a, an old hand, a pro is at reading these pathology slides. And so, you know, in, especially when we have pathology read at some like, you know, commercial pathology lab where like, you know, uh, let's say like a community urologist does a biopsy and it gets, they, they don't have like their own pathology lab. So they send it off to like a third party lab. Um, we sometimes see that when we get those slides and bring them here and review it ourselves, that we get like a different Gleason score out of it. And sometimes that ends up changing a lot of what we would plan for management. Now it doesn't happen tons and tons of times, but you know, in, if you look at literature, like, you know, anywhere as high as like, you know, sometimes up to like 10, 15% of times, like we can have like a difference of a Gleason score from a community pathologist to like someone that's more in like a high volume center. And that sometimes makes a little bit of a difference in how we wanna attack the disease. Um, Ash asked me to talk a little bit about the genomic study. Well, um, wow, that, that's, that's like a, probably deserves a talk all, all on its own. Um, but, you know, I think there's, there's a couple different ways that we can use genomics these days. One is that, um, well, I think um, the, the, I think you know in the very beginning when we're just making a diagnosis, there are a couple of different genomic tests that can be done that gives us an additional you know uh, an additional piece of data in terms of risk assessment. Because like I said, everything that I've talked about before, PSA, Gleason score, these are all kind of like you know like things that we get from labs, things that we get from like just looking under the microscope. But you know. Cancer cells, you know, they, they have mutations. They have, you know, like there's a lot of like inherent differences between one person's prostate cancer to another. And so, you know, when we look under the microscope, it doesn't capture any of that. We can't see the DNA of the tumor. And so uh, there are a couple of different labs that do this, but um, I won't bring a, anyone up by name just because, well, they're not sponsoring this, so who cares? <laughs> Um, uh, like, you know, here we'll, we'll use a lot of the, uh, we use a lot of this uh, specific assay called decipher score, but there's also Oncotype DX. There's a lot of different places that do like similar things, but Polaris. Polaris, yeah. But the idea here is that, you know, um, they actually look at the tumor DNA itself because, uh, you know, a lot of times like their formulas and things are proprietary. So we know, we don't know exactly how they calculate that risk score, but it has been validated that if they see like a specific gene signature, they kind of show that they can, they can safely say that even look, you know, this looks under the microscope might look like a Gleason seven, but under like the a, a DNA test, it looks more like high risk disease. And sometimes we take that and say like, well, look, you know, we might want to still treat this like high risk disease, even though pathology says it looks like a Gleason 7 intermediate risk. So again, it, it kind of plays a bit of a role in how we, how we risk stratify. And that ends up like, you know, leading into like how we plan to like, you know, deal with the prostate cancer uh, at large. Um, there's like a whole different discussion for genomics that we can have about yeah, hereditary yeah, yeah. testing, somatic testing, like men and maybe. Any comments or specific things for Bobby to? Okay. You'll be coming back again. I'll be back. <laughs> All right, so my name is uh, Robert Stewart. I'm a radiation oncologist. And so tonight I'm gonna to give the radiation perspective and the radiation uh, and how radiation is used for managing prostate cancer. Um, and uh, it's kind of a complicated topic, so we'll, we'll try and push through this. But a brief history. So radiation first came about, it was first used to treat a patient back in 1896. And it's come a long way since then, but it's been around for a while. And the field of radiation oncology, or the modern field of radiation oncology, began in about the 1950s with the invention of this machine. This machine is called a linear accelerator. And what it does is it, it generates or creates a beam of, of radiation that it then directs towards a tumor in a patient and treats the tumor. The radiation works by damaging the DNA in the cancer cells to the point where they can't repair themselves 
and the body then reabsorbs the tumor. And radiation works because normal tissues, the normal cells that surround the cancer cells, they have an ability to repair that DNA damage. So because of this, we can use radiation to, to treat and cure cancers. So since the 1950s, my field's come a, a, quite a far away. We've made huge technological advances and we're treating patients much more differently now than we used to. We've, we've come a long way in terms of our, um, the efficiency and the efficacy and much lower rates of side effects than we used to, uh, than we used to put patients through. So when we talk about the different types of radiation, it gets a little confusing, but what we really mean is different types of how we deliver the radiation into the tumor. When you hear about modern radiation, by far the most common type of treatment that we're talking about is external beam radiation. There are really two types of external beam radiation. The one which is the most common is using a linear accelerator. It uses what we call photons. Uh, this is a machine, like I said, that directs the radiation at the body while a patient's lying under this machine. Something uh, that's a bit newer, it's becoming more prevalent as more of these facilities are being built across the country, it's called proton therapy. And proton therapy does have its place uh, for some men in managing prostate cancer. Hasn't been the breakthrough that we had hoped, but there's certainly a place for it. And we're seeing more, more and more of... Uh, more, more and more men being treated with proton therapy. The next type of treatment is what we call brachytherapy. And so this is internal radiation, where instead of using a beam of radiation that's created outside the body and put into the body, we're actually taking tiny sources of radiation and we put them directly into the tumor itself. There are two types of brachytherapy. One is permanent, this means that we implant or we put the, the sources or seeds into the prostate. We leave them there permanently. Those seeds slowly release the radiation. So after a number of months, there's no radiation left behind, but they're left in place permanently. And the other type is a temporary implant where the seed goes in or the source goes in and it comes out that same day. And so the patient goes home without any radiation left in their body. And so all of these types of treatments are used for managing prostate cancer today. So this is a linear accelerator. It uh, delivers high energy x-rays. Um, the beam is created in the top of the machine. It's directed towards the patient. It's non-invasive. Treatments last about five minutes. Uh, you can't feel the radiation. You can't see it. Nothing touches you. Most men will sometimes ask me if the machine was even turned on because they don't feel anything but it's a non-invasive procedure. Now there are different ways or different regimens that we use to treat prostate cancer. Conventional fractionated radiation, this is the older technique. It's what we used up until about five years ago. We basically, we can't give all the radiation in a single treatment, it just overwhelm the body. So what we do is we divide it up into many smaller treatments. And as radiation oncologists, we call them fractions. So historically, we had to do 45 treatments, very low dose each day. So it was a long treatment course, it was nine weeks. As our technology got better, we were able to compress those 45 treatments into 20 or 28 treatments. We did this by increasing the dose each day and by better able to target our tumor and better able to shape our radiation fields, we were able to safely decrease the number of treatments, making it much more convenient for patients. Now what we're seeing more and more is this ultra hypofractionated radiation. It's also called stereotactic body radiotherapy, SBRT for short, or CyberKnife. CyberKnife is the brand name of a machine that delivers SBRT. And what this is, is just very high dose of radiation over a very short number of treatments. In order to do this, we need a high degree of expertise. We need to be able to see the prostate very accurately in real time so that we know we're getting the radiation exactly where it needs to go. I'll mention also that a lot of men now are going for radiation. We, we place a gel between the prostate and the rectum, and this gel pushes that rectum away from the prostate and protects the rectum from the radiation and significantly lowered the rates of rectal toxicity and bowel toxicity that we encounter with our patients. So brachytherapy, a little more invasive than uh, external beam radiation, not as invasive as a, as a prostatectomy. It's generally done when someone's asleep in the operating room, 
there's a rectal probe. It's an ultrasound probe in the rectum. It allows me or the radiation oncologist to visualize and see the prostate. And then about 14 to 20 needles are placed into the prostate. And through those needles, seeds are then introduced into the prostate. The procedure takes one to two hours. It's an outpatient procedure. So men typically go home the same day. So brachytherapy is a great treatment, but it's not for everyone. So I don't do brachytherapy in men with big prostates. If someone has a lot of upfront urinary problems, if they have difficulty with their flow, I tend to not recommend brachytherapy because it can exacerbate those symptoms. And if men have had prior procedures on their prostates, like a TERP, they're not always the best candidate for brachytherapy. So this is a list of the treatment options available for prostate cancer. There's a long list. The most standard options are really active surveillance, which is just following a patient. This is generally used for men with lower risk prostate cancers. We often just follow them, watch them very closely. Many of these men will never have any issues with the prostate cancer, never need treatment. If their prostate cancer starts to progress, then we jump in and offer them treatment then. Prostatectomy, which we'll be hearing about, external beam radiation, those, those different types I just discussed, brachytherapy on its own, and we sometimes are now combining external beam rate radiation with brachytherapy. And we tend to reserve this for men who have more aggressive or higher risk prostate cancer. So I'll kind of mention or briefly mention these, uh, the risk categories. Um, so whenever a patient comes into my office, I always ask myself, what risk category is this prostate cancer? And this is what we're referring to. These are the NCCN uh, guidelines. It's a, it's a website. It's nccn.org. There's an excellent patient section. So if you want to go there, you can read this on your own. But this basically shows how we categorize or how we break down the aggressiveness of prostate cancers. This is really important for me to know what aggressiveness someone's prostate cancer is so I can appropriately prescribe and make my recommendations. Because we want to match the aggressiveness of our treatment with the aggressiveness of the cancer. So you don't want to overtreat, but we similarly don't want to undertreat. So if you go through that website, you'll see that there's different treatment options, many different treatment options for each risk category of prostate cancer. So in terms of the side effects of radiation, so with radiation, we divide the side effects into the early ones and the late ones. So the early ones are the ones that happen while you're on treatment. Um, they tend to arise around the second or third week, depending on your treatment, and they gradually improve when treatment is done. Most men get through treatment I'd say about 20 to 30% of men need some sort of an intervention like a medication, creams or ointments to alleviate some of the symptoms of the radiation. And these side effects usually resolve a couple of weeks after treatment is done. So these side effects are urinary symptoms. So while you're on treatment, the prostate can swell, you get inflammation in the prostate and this can lead to frequency. You get a weaker stream, some urgency. Men can complain of a little bit of burning. It's generally very well tolerated. We also have bowel symptoms. We see these less frequently now with our, with our modern radiation uh, techniques, but about 10 to 15% of men will have some issues with frequency, diarrhea, or inflammation in the rectum, which is also called proctitis. Uh, this can lead to some burning with bowel movements, but we have an ointment or steroid creams generally resolve these symptoms. And while you're going through treatment, you're followed very closely by a radiation oncologist. They see you at least once a week address how you're feeling, address these side effects and make sure that you're comfortable going through treatment. Fatigue. So almost all patients universally get tired on treatment. And I always recommend that men continue to exercise throughout treatment to combat this fatigue. Late side effects. These are the ones that happen after treatment is done, months, even years after treatment. And they generally arise because of scar tissue that forms after radiation. So to some degree, they may be permanent. We see moderate bowel symptoms in about three to 6% of men after treatment. And the majority of these bowel symptoms are what I see is rectal bleeding. So men go to the bathroom, they see some blood in the bowl. Usually goes away on its own. A small percentage of those men need a procedure like a scope, laser to seal off any, any bloody, uh, bleeding blood vessels. You can see urinary symptoms again in about three to 5% of men long-term. Majority of those are like a urinary stricture where you get scar tissue and narrowing of the urethra requires a procedure like a scope and dilation to open it up. And then erectile dysfunction. So this is a complicated issue. Studies 
quote, different numbers of erectile dysfunction. They have different definitions of erectile dysfunction. But I'd say, you know, most of them are around 50% of men. What I find is that the biggest predictor of erectile dysfunction is someone's pre-treatment erectile function. So it's always important to optimize sexual function before you start treatment and medications, different, uh, different treatments for ED are still very effective after whatever treatment men go through. Incontinence. So we see incontinence very rarely in radiation. This study here quoted about less than 5% of men at two years had, had incontinence. It tends to be more of an issue after surgery. While our bowel symptoms tend to be more of an issue after radiation as opposed to surgery. So you can see that side effects are very you know, somewhat different between radiation and surgery. The other issue is radiation-induced cancers. This is a, a concerning issue that radiation can in fact actually cause cancers. It's true, you know, we do see a very small risk of bladder cancers and rectal cancers in men following radiation. The risk is very low, it generally takes 10, 20, or more years to develop, and the risk is less than 1%, much less than 1%, but still real, and it's important that we, caught, we counsel men about this potential risk down the road. We're sometimes now combining external beam radiation and brachytherapy. This is generally done for men with more advanced cancers. There's been a big study that showed that by doing this combination, we actually improve cure rates in men with advanced prostate cancers. The cost is that we have higher rates of, of urinary symptoms down the road that require intervention. So it's important to discuss this potential treatment with your radiation ecologist to see if it's, it's valuable for you and whether or not the cost uh, is worth the, the, the benefit. We sometimes recommend hormonal therapy with radiation as well. Again, this is usually for men with higher risk prostate cancers, but it's important to know that your radiation ecologist may be recommending radiation along with hormonal therapy as a package deal. So when you compare surgery and radiation, the recommendations are going to be based on what risk, what risk category your prostate cancer is, how advanced the cancer is, medical comorbidities. Someone may have medical comorbidities that may preclude them from going to the operating room to have a prostatectomy. Baseline urological function. We know that men who have poor upfront urological function may have worse side effects during radiation. And prostate size. The larger the prostate, the more risk of obstructive urinary symptoms during treatment. Surgery and radiation are both available options for, for most men who have a good life expectancy and have localized prostate cancer. There is some evidence, some randomized evidence that's a, that compares surgery to radiation in the low and intermediate risk men. And what it universally shows is that men do well. Men live a long time, whether they go for surgery or radiation. So what's really important is figuring out which side effects you're particularly at risk for and to try and improve your quality of life as much as possible. In the higher risk men, there's not so much evidence that compares radiation and surgery. I will say that you know, some men with higher risk prostate cancers, there may be a risk after surgery that the cancer, there may be some residual cancer, in which case you may be going through a long course of radiation. So in that setting, you'd be exposed to the side effects of radiation and surgery. So perhaps if someone's gonna require radiation after surgery, it may make sense to go for radiation up front to avoid the side effects of both modalities. So ultimately, men are expected to do well, long life expectancy. So because of this, it's important that you consider the long-term quality of life, potential side effects associated with each treatment as they pertain to each individual and their unique cancer. So in my opinion, all patients should be given the opportunity to see a urologist and a radiation ecologist, review the treatments, review the logistics, potential side effects associated with each treatment so you can make an informed decision regarding your health. So I have a few quick examples. Um, this is a 60 year old male. He's got a low risk prostate cancer or an intermediate risk prostate cancer. Uh, his prostate's not too large, about 40 grams. He has no urinary symptoms. So he comes into my office and he asks me what, you know, what he should do. And I see this quite often and it can be challenging for patients because this is the kind of guy that I would call an all options guy. He's gonna do well with surgery. He's gonna do with, well, well with radiation. He can do five treatments. He can do 28 treatments. He can do brachytherapy. So sometimes 
having a choice can be challenging. It can be overwhelming, but it's ultimately not a bad thing to have. So you can make the decision for yourself as to what particular side effects you're willing to accept. Um, so this next patient, you know, six year old male, similar story is a low intermediate risk prostate cancer, but he's a large prostate, it's hundred grams. He's already having some issues with his urinary flow. It takes a long time to empty his bladder. So what are his options? Well, this is the kind of guy who may come into my office who I may think surgery may be a good option for him because he has a big prostate. He's experiencing obstructive symptoms. So surgery may be able to alleviate his obstruction as well as the cancer. He's still a candidate for, for radiation. It's just this kind of guy would require some, we'd have to address his urinary symptoms before we start radiation to lower his risk of side effects. And finally, this is a 60 year old gentleman. He's got a high risk prostate cancer, at least in nine, his PSA is high. His prostate's very firm, it's nodular, feels very abnormal. You can feel that the cancer is extending into the tissues that surround the prostate. So what are his, his options? So he's got multiple options. The one thing I would caution is that if he goes for surgery, there's a risk or there's a possibility that he'll require radiation afterwards as the, can, as the, the surgery may not get rid of all of the cancer. So thank you. It's a good idea for me to just kind of talk for a few minutes as to what in my office I consider the counseling and hopefully you will, some of you know me. So the things which I am factoring in into my discussion about what best treatment option should be is the number one is what is the grade of the cancer? And many a times I'm pretty good in talking a patient out of any discussion about treatment and put them on an active surveillance because they don't need any treatment. And active surveillance doesn't mean no treatment Active surveillance means no treatment at that moment, and we'll watch you closely. And if something changes, then we will change our mind. And I have literally a couple of thousand patients on active surveillance at this point. Second discussion comes as to surgery versus radiation discussion. But before that, nowadays, we are getting a lot involved with the focal therapy and the cryotherapy and different kinds of focal therapies, and we will have a discussion about it. I also want to know the stage by the MRI. I'm a big proponent of an MRI. I want to look at the MRI and understand if the cancer is within the prostate or is it going out. If it is within the prostate and it is a meaningful cancer, essentially it's not a Gleason 6, it's not a Woodlow volume Gleason 7. So it's in potentially important prostate cancer. And next thing I look at it, what's the life expectancy of the patient? If patient is likely to live more than 10, 14 years, I tend to trigger more towards the removal discussion. If patients are otherwise slow and they have other medical, medical problems that they may have to deal with that before the prostate cancer discussion happens, they are more a better candidate for radiation therapy in my mind. Patients who already have a very big prostate, meaning they have avoiding issues going on, they may get Worse, if I don't remove the prostate, so I tend to prefer the removal part in that cohort. Patients who are very young, patients who are in their 50s and 60s, because if the cancer is within the prostate, I can really do a good nerve sparing and majority of them will get their erections back within health. It takes some time. So then also I prefer more of the removal discussion. And most important point here is, not just that it can cure it better, but what happens if the cancer comes back? And cancer comes back even after the removal, even in an intermediate risk prostate cancer, 10, 20% times, 30% times cancer will come back. Not happen next year, will happen maybe 10 years later, 20 years later. What options we have at that time? And that is where the life expectancy discussion comes in. And that's the reason a younger, healthier patient, I tend to recommend more removal because if I need to salvage the situation, I have options easily available. While I do perform salvage radical prostatectomy, it's not the same operation. There are a lot of complications in doing it. So that is one of the factors we factor in. Some patients cannot have surgery because they have had so many surgeries in that area that there are extra stuff in that part of the body. 
we sometimes have to embark upon them even though understanding the complications because if the complications initially started with the bowel they cannot have irradiation easily so now we have to go into a battlefield and try to remove them so it's not an easy surgery that is where we have a discussion more complications happen sometimes they have an ileostomy and other issues so that's another thing which we look at it and then the last part is if patient doesn't have a metastatic cancer it's a locally advanced cancer it's a high risk cancer i personally believe that high risk cancer is a multi modality treatment by multi modality i mean this patient in his life cycle most likely is going to need surgery radiation hormones repeat hormones and all those things and if i didn't start with surgery first round a i don't have the tissue to kind of analyze more of the details and then secondly for me to go back later after radiation will be a tricky job so these are the my gut feeling discussions but i was just the substitute because the real person has come come on and feed it i was just entertaining them let me give a background dr wicklin is my best friend and he is world's best surgeon in in robotics and urological complex procedures he was chair of Karolinska where the Nobel prizes are given he is from Sweden and he has been with us for last 6 years he heads the bladder cancer program but he does prostates and everything complex in the pelvis and he has studied the data of Karolinska in which long term prostate cancer patients were followed so Thank by you. the way he was very kind okay i'm for uh, maybe i'm not so kind i don't know we <laughs> we can i discuss afterwards but so i we'll try to uh, uh, tell you i'm not going to convince you to do this or that but i'm going to tell you why i think that most patient will benefit from surgery rather than uh, radiation so and i have let's see if Sorry, i can I no, that's not your where is the where is this one to this one is this here ah there it is so disclosure so i have done many thousands of robotic prostatectomies Uh, so, which means that, of course, I'm biased for surgery, basically. Uh, but I'm also a bladder cancer surgeon, so here I'm director of bladder cancer, and is that relevant? Yes, in a way, uh, because bladder cancer is one of the side effects after radiation. So you have two times the risk of getting bladder cancer if you have radiation. So I see in my practice here uh, patients that develop bladder cancer sometimes after radiation, and I'm also a reconstructive surgeon, which means I'm dealing with very complex pelvic surgery. and unfortunately not very many but few patients that have radiation have very complex side effects that come very late in life <coughs> so that's my sort of background here uh, and i don't know if, how many of you are using chat gpt but this is you know all the students are using this every time now to see what's the best answer so if you go to at least two month ago or something this is from two month surgery or radiation for prostate cancer i don't know if you discussed this already or but if if you look uh, then the this basically it says the decision to undergo surgery or radiation for prostate cancer depends on several factors including the stage of the cancer the patient's age and health status and personal preferences <laughs> and it ends like it's important for patient to discuss the pros and cons of each option with the doctor and make an informed decision based on their specific circumstances so and i think that's very true Um, so I'm basically going to talk about two things: outcomes after this treatment, radiation and surgery. And there are you can basically have them two groups. So one has to do with functional sort of side effects of treatments, so like in, incontinence, uh, rectal dysfunction, and all these things that you can have after surgery and radiation. And the other part is the oncological outcomes: how many patients do we actually cure? and i have done a lot of research most of the slides i'm going to be very scientific so maybe it's boring i don't know but i think that if you want to understand this you have to be very scientific because otherwise it becomes very difficult so what we are discussing very often is biochemical recurrence and unfortunately we don't have a very good way to measure biochemical recurrence of the radiation or of the surgery so we can compare them very well and that's what i'm trying to explain for you uh, and the best way to measure the outcome of surgery is the mortality unfortunately or fortunately you can say unfortunate for scientists but fortunate for patient it takes very many years for most patients to die from prostate most patients don't die from prostate cancer number one number two the ones that die they live for many years which means that if you start a project when you are 45 you're likely to be retired before you actually have a matured 
research projects. So this is from one of my projects. I'm the chairman of a European scientific working group for, for robotic surgery. And here is the long term. This is from eight centers. So you see up here, you see the dotted lines. They are the prostate cancer mortality. So if you have surgery, you see that, and you are low risk, green or intermediate risk, there is virtually no one that dies within 20 years. It's very, very few patients die from prostate cancer. There is the green and the blue line down here. They are the ones that die in the group. So they are more likely to die, much more likely to die from something else. In fact, you're so healthy that if you have prostate cancer and have surgery and you go out to the street and take anyone here in New York at your age, he is more likely to die before you. Okay, so there is a selection process here that depending on the treatment you get. And you also see that if you have what we call then high risk tumors, yes, you have a risk to die, but still you only have like 15% risk of dying from prostate cancer within uh, almost 20 years. So the mortality, the prostate cancer mortality is very low, which is great, but also makes it difficult to compare because there is, it's also low mortality of the radiation. Uh, so the problem is that we don't want to wait 20 years. We want to compare immediately. So then we have a lot of surrogate endpoints, basically. And we're using, in surgery, we often use this PSA more than 0.2, uh, because then we can actually establish so most patients, not all, but most patients that actually have 0.2 after surgery, it's due to cancer. But very often that I, I will show you this, it's not relevant because they will not die from prostate cancer, even if the PSA is coming back. Uh, after radiation, then it's much more difficult because the prostate is still there. So many patients have a PSA value, uh, and which means that they, you, you, we usually use Phoenix criteria is the most commonly used. So you go to the lowest point of your PSA, and if it rises two, then you say that the cancer is back. Uh, unfortunately, that is very different. That means very different things in the for the patients. So here, this is. Uh, then from, uh, this is from Stockholm, you know, this, is, I will show you a lot of slides from Stockholm and that's not, well, I'm from Stockholm, but it's basically because we can do research there that you cannot do here. Because in Sweden, everyone that is born has a specific number and you cannot enter any hospital. You cannot get out of any diagnosis or once you have it, it follows you around. And you have the same number when you pay tax and when your education and that you, when you get married or your insurance or everything. So you, we can follow these patients almost perfectly, which is not so easy to do here. So for research purpose, this is great. Anyhow, you see here that if you have a radical prostatectomy and you have a recurrence, which means your PSA is then more than 0.2. And if you are a high risk, that has to do with Gleason and, and a little bit how quickly your PSA is rising you see that you have maybe a eight or nine percent risk of dying from prostate cancer and if you have a low risk it's maybe less than five percent risk in 10 years if you have a recurrence after radiation you have much higher risk of dying so this a recurrence after radiation is much worse or much higher risk of dying from the disease if you have it so that's why you cannot compare the number of patients with biochemical recurrence because they are not comparable, basically. Okay, You're, if anyone has questions, I'm happy to take questions because this becomes a little bit complicated. Okay, uh, however, in, in the, we are using this very often, this biochemical recurrence, and there is a lot of publications. So every year, lots and lots and lots of publications. It's focal treatment, it's radiation, it's surgery, and they have different biochemical recurrence definitions. And usually they don't follow patients more than 10 years. But for prostate cancer, that's basically not enough. You have to follow patients longer because it takes much longer to die for most patients. Uh, so, which means that there's a lot of things published, which is not, uh, I would say, scientifically correct, but still used. Uh, so just to illustrate this, this is a, patient, a cohort of 2,000 patients. And depending on, this is surgery patients. So if you look at this and you look at the patient, then you see that the risk of having a biochemical recurrence, it varies then depending on what... Uh, uh, how you, what's your relapse threshold? So we have normally after surgery 0.2, so this is this black line. There is 39 patients of these 2,100 actually had a metastasis during these 10 years. Uh, but if you have this as your biochemical recurrence, or you will say that the relapse rate is 24%. If you change to one, you have 
10% relapse. If you change to two, like if you would have surgery, you have your lowest PCA plus two, that line will go down here then. So then you'll have much fewer patients that have a recurrence, but you still have exactly the same number of patients that have metastasis or die for that matter. We didn't study that, but here, so you see that depending on how you put or you place your threshold, you will have very different outcomes. And then it becomes very difficult to compare if different this, you know, uh, treatments have different way of measuring this, it's almost impossible to, to compare them. Uh, and one other pr problem of the radiation is that it's relatively common that you have, this is the latest I could find, this is a study that they do biopsies after radiation so that they, two, between two and three years after radiation, they did prostate biopsies. And I think 28% of patients actually had cancer in the prostate, but no one had the biochemical recurrence at that point. So it's, you go a little bit longer under the radar of the radiation, whereas in surgery, you find very easily or very quickly that you have recurrence. And it may be good or bad. So this is also a little bit complicated. Mm -hmm. It's like there are two antibiotics for a new fever which has come up. For one antibiotic, success is if you don't get fever above 99, you are cured. And the other antibiotic, it has to be 101 and more. That's the difference what Dr. Wicklin is trying to say, that the biochemical recurrence word which is used is different in the two different modalities. And after recurrence in prostate cancer surgery, what happens later on is very slow and people don't really die. But the other way around, when recurrence happens after radiation, things escalate very fast. And one thing which is absolutely measurable is whether the patient is alive or not alive. That's when they look at the data in a long term for that. That's what he's finding, that there may be some differences in a long term for patients who were alive or not alive. Every other criteria looks different because the PSA numbers are different. That's, that's I think, what you're saying. Yes. Uh, so I have this register uh, where we can follow all patients that have prostate cancer. You know exactly what they died of. And this has uh, been published in many uh, trials and they have been evaluated. The, the cause of death registry for prostate cancer and so on. 98% of all prostate cancers in Sweden will actually be there. So I did a study. This is published in British Medical Journal a couple of years ago that had 35,000 men that had radiation or prostatectomy as the primary treatment uh, between uh, 96 and uh, 2010 or something like that. I don't remember exactly. But the information we know is that we know when they had the diagnosis, we know how old they were, we know if they died from prostate cancer or they died from something else. We know the PSA, the clinical stage. We know if they have you know, lymph nodes, if they have metastasis. We know this Gleason score, which is the most important predictor of uh, mortality in prostate cancer. We know the comorbidity index. We know whether they are married or divorced or single and all of these things, uh, education level. Uh, so which means that we can do much more elaborate statistical analysis of the, uh, we, you cannot do that. It's very difficult to do here in the US because we don't just have that information. Here it's actually for, I'm working a lot with bladder cancer here and that's like difficult to, to keep track of if patients are alive or if they are dead. Whereas in Sweden, then I just put in this number in the computer and it says immediately, this patient is dead. Do you really want to open this patient record? And that's the same day as they die. So that comes up immediately. So it's for, for research purpose, it's great. So then we, what we did was we then, to have a better comparison, we, um, divided or stratified into different risk groups and looked at the mortality. And this is how it looked. So this is the surgery part and this is the radiation part. And you see this dark blue and this dark red, these are the patients that actually died from prostate cancer. And this more light blue and, and an orange or whatever it is here, these are the patients that died from something else. And you can see that there is a slight difference here, so that there's a little bit more patient dying. There's the dark red is a little bit more than the dark blue and so on here. So there is an increase in the mortality. And if you do then the statistical analysis of this, uh, you can see that there is approximately 
uh, depending on what type of uh, there, this is probably the best and more at least the most modern way of doing it. Uh, and there's a factor of 1.7 to 6, so almost a factor of 2. So you have almost a double risk of dying from prostate cancer if you have radiation compared to surgery. If we try to com have comparable groups and adjust for all the factors that we know today is important for the mortality. Uh, so we looked into this here. This is something we did here at Mount Sinai. We looked at all studies that have looked at prostate cancer mortality and used the same statistical comparison from everything that is published after 2000, everything we found that was published after 2011 and looking at mortality. And you see that these studies tend to favor, so prostate cancer mortality studies favor surgery over uh, radiation. But I will also show you that if you look at biochemical recurrent studies, they will favor radiation because they measure, yeah, we have difficult, different definitions basically. So in Stockholm, we also have the other register there where we measure. There's a lot of Stockholm, unfortunately, but we don't have it here in, in New York. But in Stockholm, there is only three labs that are taking PSA. And we get all the PSA that are taken in Stockholm. No, it doesn't matter who sent them there. If it's like the family doctor or the urologist or someone else, so they go to their, some other doctor. All PSAs comes to us. So we can follow our patients for a long, long time. And we also have all their... PSA values. And this is then linked to a lot of registry for you know, drug prescription, for surgery, radiation, and so on. So we have a lot of information. And if you look at, so in this study, we included all men between 40 and 75 that had a diagnosis of post prostate cancer. And they were treated with either prostatectomy or radiation therapy with or without hormonal treatment. And most patients had a combination nowadays with radiation and hormonal treatment. And if you then look, it looks very similar to what we have already said before. You see that the mortality in the radical prostatectomy group is lower. This is the mortality from here to here. So this is the prostate cancer mortality. And this is the other course mortality. And you see that here is prostate cancer, other course, and this is the overall. So this is all patients that die. Okay. So that even here, it looks like there is a pretty much a factor of two. When you adjust for this difference, that the mortality is uh, lower. But if you look at overall survival, I think, I don't know if you have discussed this before, but and cancer-specific surgery is better. But if you look at biochemical recurrence, it's the other way around. When you go to the doctor, you only get the, you, you, the doctor will tell you whether you have a recurrence or not. Uh, they will not tell you whether there is a difference in the sensitivity of how to detect uh, biochemical recurrence, for instance. But here is this surgery, or this slide again, and there you see that the difference in, in the risk of dying, depending on uh, if you have a, a, your biochemical recurrence after radiation or after radical prostatectomy. I'm going to interfere with the 30 second. There is something new coming out, and I think someone was asking that question. There is a new test which has become available, PSMA PET scan. I think that will be a big game changer because PSA values are a number of a biochemical test, but very often we will be doing PSMA PET scan and if the PSA ever goes up and that can compare things in much better way. Is that right? I think PSMA PET scan will help us in resolving this thing, hopefully. Absolutely. This is a more sensitive way that, but sometimes you don't want, um, so the, we have a much more sort of efficient way of finding recurrences of the surgery, but we find a lot of unnecessary recurrences that would be better not to find. So I think that's in some aspect, it's better to have it like radiation. You don't see them uh, until they become more clinically significant. And the, the problem is, of course, that we have something to do when there is a recurrence after surgery. We can, you can get help from the radiation. Whereas it's very difficult to, especially, I think it has to do with the recurrence. So when you, when you discover a tumor that recur after radiation, it's usually more advanced. It doesn't, in most patients, it's not enough to do a radical prostatectomy at that point, because usually the tumor is outside. So we have easier to combine surgery and radiation, starting surgery and then radiation, then the other way around. And I think partly is that because we don't see the early recurrences of the radiation. Maybe if we found them, we could actually do more what we call a salvage prostatectomy and take out prostates if the radiation did, hasn't worked. So this is the PROTECT trial, the English paper that we just discussed. 
And this is my basically last point here. We just want to go through this. And if you look at this, you see that there is basically excellent survival. No one dies from prostate cancer in this trial. We know that it's not true because we know that patients die from prostate cancer. So what, why are no one dying from prostate cancer in this trial? You can wonder. Well, it's because they selected patients when they randomized that are virtually only low risk or intermediate risk patients. And as you know, then from our previous slides, they have a very low mortality. So if you look at this, this is the uh, pathology from all the patients that had prostatectomy. And you see that there are actually only 12 patients out of the 500 that have high risk prostate cancer. So if you do a trial and looking at mortality to, as an endpoint, and you only include patients that are not dying from prostate cancer, you will not find anything. And you, don't, you didn't find a lot of things here then. These are patients good for active surveillance, but that's what- Yes, Dr. nowadays these saying. patients- we here, we would at least recommend them active surveillance as a discussion point. Yes, so nowadays, most of these patients would be act, going to active monitoring. The problem here is that this study is now used to uh, sort of tell people what to do when they have prostate cancer. And probably it's not really relevant for many patients, for some patients, absolutely, but for some, not so irrelevant. And one other thing which is interesting to see is that the patient here, they so you see the ones that had prostatectomy or radiation, and you see the active monitoring after 14, 15 years, almost 70% of the patient had actually had treatment. So it's not like it's active monitoring, it's a deferred treatment. So they will have the treatment, but at a later stage, at least many of them which also is an interesting factor. But they also looked at uh, side effects. And one of the reasons when you, when you counsel patients is not only mortality, because whether you have radiation or surgery, you, you probably have a good survival. So because both treatments give you good survival. And even many patients don't even need treatment and they still have good survival. So this is the, the problem. And if you look at this then so that you see this red here is surgery and you see that radical prostatectomy has more incontinence it varies over time a little bit, so you have more just after surgery and it goes down, but it's, it is more. So you see more uh, incontinence, uh, which we know, of course. But we also know that uh, if you do a, uh, this is a symptom score. You see that the, both the red and the yellow have a little bit more than the blue, but it's, over time, there's basically no difference. Uh, and what you see also is that you nocturia, so the patient going up at night, that's higher in the radiation because we know that radiation causes sometimes a little bit of inflammation in the bladder, sometimes a real severe inflammation that comes many years after. But most patients have this little bit uh, like urgency symptoms from the bladder, or most, I wouldn't say, but more than of the surgery. So some patients have it, okay? Uh, if you look at erection, there is also a difference between the treatment and you see that there is the red a line here, there's more erection problems after surgery than after radiation. They tend to go together over time also here. So the more the longer you wait, the, the more similar they're going to be. But in the beginning, absolutely, it's a, a difference in favor of radiation, at least in the beginning. But over time, usually if you have high dose of radiation, it's not good for your erection over time. But one thing then, which is important, this is from the Lapra trial. This is one of the trials that is also from Sweden. Uh, and you see, this is the risk of having a continent or erectile dysfunction from different surgeons. And all the, the this was supposedly the expert surgeons. I know this one was, this is me. So if you, I did the surgery, the outcome was very good. And if this guy did the surgery, the outcome was very bad. So as a patient, you should choose a good surgeon, basically, because that's, especially for the erectile out outcome, it's important. It's not so important for oncological outcome, because that seems to be less, much less difference between different surgeons. So the cure rate is pretty similar, but the functional outcome is different. So that's why you should go to someone who's doing thousands and thousands of procedures. And it's not so, if you look at this, it's not so strange, because this is the prostate. Here you see the neurovascular bundle, and you see this is a little bit like peeling an orange, but you have to do it with a very, very high precision. If you peel your way into the prostate here, then you may have cancer cells still there. If you cut, you see these small white things here. These are the autonomic nerves. So these are the nerves. It's not like one nerve going there. 
it's hundreds of nerves that go down like this. And you have to basically preserve all of this then. If, you, if you're good at it, you will have better outcome. And it's not easy. I've, and it's, here it actually looks easy, but in real life, it's not easy. Bowel function is the, uh, maybe the, the, the prob problem part of uh, radiation, because if you look at uh, bowel symptoms, they are more common after radiation, because some of the, the, it doesn't matter if you think you do a very high precision radiation, some of the radiation will hit the bowel, and some patients are sensitive for this. And if you look at, uh, for instance, fecal incontinence, you see that is actually increased here after radiation. So you have more urine incontinence after surgery, a little bit more fecal incontinence after radiation. So the, the, there is none of these effective treatments that are without side effects, unfortunately. But if you look at the general quality of life, all of them are the same. Doesn't matter what you do. So your general feeling of or quality of life would be very similar. Um, so that basically is due to that these, uh, the, the actually uh, questionnaires and so on are not very sensitive, I think, but it's also a general finding. So I think we'll hope this, but I think that in the end, then there is a lot of individual factors that should uh, guide the patient for, for treatment. So for me, then I will tend to, for instance, say that the patient that have a big tumor at the apical part of the prostate where it's very close to the muscle that keeps you continent, maybe you should have radiation rather than surgery. Uh, if you're very fat, maybe that's also a good candidate for uh, radiation rather than surgery. So high BMA. Age is the other way around. So if you're young, I, don't, I would recommend no one under 60 or maybe even 65 to have surgery if there is not a very good indication because you have much higher risk of developing the more severe long-term side effects of radiation. Uh, size of prostate more also, so the larger prostate uh, may be more difficult to cover with the radiation and may be easier to take out with surgery. So there are different factors that are more sort of patient-specific, and then I guess you've already discussed the, the preference of the patient also, of course, you know, but, you know, how important is rectal function and, and things like that is going to be important. In, this is a little bit like the Supreme Court. You have three surgeons and one radiation oncologist. Uh, uh, you know, and, and, and you, you might say that uh, it takes three surgeons to counter the brilliance of a single radiation oncologist. Uh, um, you, so um, when, uh, when I uh, look at this and uh, I, uh, for 50 years, I was a surgeon. I quit operating in 2021. And now, as I sum it up, it seems to me, uh, you could say from the Swedish data, if you look at the Swedish data, that uh, very little difference between whether somebody had surgery or radiation therapy for up to five years. But when the longer you follow the patients at 10 and 15 years, there is a difference in both the overall mortality uh, and the cancer-specific mortality. So when you go and look at papers and read them, you need to focus on treatments that have a follow-up of 10 to 15 years. Uh, a patient dies of prostate cancer when they're 80 years on average. So if you have a 50-year-old patient who's undergone surgery, you need to follow them for 30 years before they can actually die. Uh, urinary incontinence is clearly a little bit higher with uh, surgery. Um, than with radiation, uh, but irritative symptoms are a little bit higher with uh, radiation than surgery. In terms of erectile function, um, about 50% of men have erectile function. We saw the box of the best surgeon in Sweden and his potency rate at, uh, at 24 months was 60%. So that's a baseline that you need to uh, to think about, you'd have the same results with radiation therapy in in, in Sweden. You certainly have that uh, with radiation therapy in the United States and the National Cancer Institute data. Uh, the only way that you can minimize that at this point uh, is either to go to a surgeon who's better than Dr. Wickland, which doesn't exist clearly, uh, um, uh, or uh, or to have partial gland treatment. And this is where focal therapy uh, comes in in its, very, in, in its varying forms. So when patients come to me, um, I uh, send them a questionnaire 
so that uh, I can find out what uh, their uh, preferences are. Uh, so if you fill out the questionnaire, um, you will tell me what it is that concerns you with, with your treatment. And by the time they come to me, on average, they have seen five doctors. So they do have ideas and, and they have been uh, going and asking uh, questions. Uh, and then depending on what's important for you, um, I will uh, focus my discussion on that and, and try to tell you what I know about the, about the, uh, about the disease. Um, so I'm going to ask you these questions and we'll have a real life consultation. There are no right answers. Um, any one of you can answer it and, and, and we'll jot it down. So I'm going to have a, a Kaushik come and uh, let's see if we can get the internet. So this um, is a product called Wiser Care. Um, it's not available um, easily. Uh, it was uh, uh, created at UCLA. Uh, it's been studied in California at Vanderbilt, and we've been using it uh, since I came to Sinai three years ago. So um, I'm going to get started with this. And um, it tells you when you get this that you can write in comments. We won't have time to do the comments now, so I'm just going to uh, going to ask you the question. Um, somebody asked, "What is it that we need uh, to get to counsel you? We need to know what your PSA is. We need to know what your Gleason score is. What the pathologist read the biopsy is." We would like to know your T-stage, and that is, is the cancer confined to the prostate or on rectal exam or on MRI, has the cancer spread beyond the prostate? Uh, and we would need uh, your weight and height, and if there are things that, uh, if you have a bleeding tendency or something like that, uh, we, we, we would need to know that. <clears throat> So uh, I'm going to ask you uh, to be a hypothetical patient and pick a number for the PSA. Uh, you, you need, can you, uh, I'll, 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 I'll. wants to take a lead or should I just pretend to do so? Please. 3.6. 3.6, okay. What four is your? Three. Four plus three, okay. T-stage. T-stage. Uh, did anyone tell you if they can feel cancer in the prostate or? Well, I think T2. T2, okay. How old are you? 63. Um, and they ask about uh, the race, uh, and I'm going to put Caucasian or white. Uh, would you like to change it to Asian or mixed or black, or should we just leave it like that? Leave it, leave it like that. And... Weight? 190. 190, okay. Height? 5'11". 5'11". Has your doctor told you that your cancer has spread to other parts of the body? No, this is primarily for people whose cancer is still localized to the prostate. Um, and, and then it asks you a list of medical conditions. So you might pick one or two of them, or you might say you have no medical conditions. How, uh, you know? Hypertension. Hypertension. Hypertension is not uh, in Asia. here. Asia. So should I put myocardial infarction? It, uh, uh, no. Uh, so the, the choices it gives you and, and they're doing this because in their analysis, these are the things that affected surgery, not so much radiation. Uh, diabetes, myocardial infarction, liver disease, peptic ulcer disease, AIDS, mild liver disease, dementia, any other cancer, peripheral vascular disease. Is that what you want to put in? Peripheral vascular disease? Let's put that in. Uh, renal disease, congestive heart failure, uh, diabetes with end, end organ disease, metastasis from another cancer. 
diabetes with endo no this only only if you have diabetes up top okay all right um have you had a stroke epilepsy parkinson's disease or migraines no no okay um have you leaked urine uh, I mean, I think let's, let's, I will pretend to be depressed. Okay. So, and it all fills it in. Really or never is fine. It's fine. Total control is good. Occasional dribbling. Okay. Occasional dribbling. Uh, uh. Occasional dribbling. Mm -hmm. yeah. Next, yeah. next. How big a problem is this uh, a dripping bean? Very small. Very small. Okay. So no, nothing else is there. Uh, everything else is there. Uh, have you had any problems with bowel movements? Uh, how about directions? Any problem with erectile okay, function? No. Very good. Uh, orgasm is good. Yeah. Quality of erections is good. So let's go on to the next. Um, heart flashes, feeling depressed, lack of energy, change in body weight. No. During Diwali, my weight increases. <laughs> this is the time when we eat sweets. Okay. Now, now you'll have to make a few choices. And I think this is where you guys want to. This is where you should. Uh, it, it becomes important what is personal. So on the left side is a scenario where a year after treatment, your erections are much less frequent or firm than they are today. But you know you're going to live 15 years. On the right side, you have no problem with directions. Your directions are fine. But you can only get 10 years of life. Strongly prefer. Which one? Then it's like 10 year one. Strongly ten -year. prefer the 10 year one? Yeah. yeah. OK. The next question is frequent trips to the bathroom for a bowel movement and urinary control. So you quite frequently need to have bowel movement, often with less notice, but a year after treatment, your ability to hold urine is unchanged. On the right side, your bowel patterns remain the same, no problems with bowel movements, but you leak urine and you need to wear one pad to stay dry, which would you prefer? And the answer could be no preference. I mean, it might be something that you can't make a decision at this point. No preference, yeah, okay. And that's what uh, the default fills out. Here on the left side, you have frequent bowel movements, no change in urination. On the right side, your bowel movements remain the same but you need to freak, uh, urinate more frequently with some pain and often with little notice. Which one of these outcomes would, would be acceptable to you, more acceptable to you? Once again, if you have no preference, you have slight no preference right. slight preference on the, So this one, okay. Next would be complications from surgery. Uh, you get a complication from surgery such as bleeding. There's a small chance that it would lead to long-term health outcomes, but you have no problems with urination. You have no complications from surgery. Maybe you have ha not had surgery, but you leak urine and need an absorbent pad to, to, uh, to stay dry. So you have had surgery, I guess. Uh, so which... Slight we, preference on the left. Slight preference on the left. Recovery time. You have a treatment at a hospital facility and go home the same day. You can return to normal activities after two days of recovery. You may have some pain for a few days. And a year after treatment, you can have erections like you do today. On the right side, your doctors meet with you every six months to monitor your prostate. You may get a biopsy every one to two years. You can keep doing all your normal activities. If anything changes, you can get other prostate, other treatments. And your erections are much less frequent or firm than they are today. Left. 
Strongly preferred. Okay. Okay. Um, you quite frequently need to urinate with some pain and often with little notice. One year after treatment, you can have erections like you do today. Your urination remains the same, but your erections are much less frequent. Strongly prefer? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you think you'd be comfortable filling these out at home before you came to see? Yes. So you could take your time, talk to your partner, and then, and then do it. So this is what we'll do. We'll send it to you. And then I, you know, I can avoid this 15 or 20 minutes. Uh, um, How do we access this ourselves? You, you can. You just uh, uh, you, you, you call the office and we'll send you the link. Yeah. Yeah. So um, should, should I go through the six more to go? Six, six more? Go through it? Okay. You quite frequently need to urinate with some pain, but you live 15 years. You urinate just the same, but you only live for 10 years. I can strongly prefer. Which one do you prefer? Left, Left strongly prefer, or slightly prefer? There, okay. All right. Uh, you get a complication from surgery, very small chance that it's not self-revolving, or a small chance. Your bowel movement remains the same. You experience no complications from surgery, but you have frequent bowel movements. Here? Okay. You have a treatment with a one to two, do, to do two hospital days. You have some pain. At home, you need four weeks to recover. You have a tube in the penis to help drain the urine for the first two weeks. One year after treatment, you can have erections like you have today. Your doctors meet with you every six months to monitor the prostate. You get a biopsy every one to two years. You can do your normal activity. A year after treatment, though, your erections are much less frequent or firm than they are today. Right. Left. Right. Left, right. So, <laughs> well, since we've had left on this, I'll just put the right. Uh, how strongly do you want to be want to go on the right? Not very. Slightly. Slightly. <laughs> Slightly, yeah. So you can see that the answers are not the same even among you, even in this hypothetical situation. And that's why I would like to individualize what I discuss with you about, uh, about what uh, you can have. Uh, frequent bowel movements, often with little notice, but live 15 years. No problems in bowels, live for 10 years. Well, strongly prefer. One year after treatment, problems with erections, but no problems with urination. One year after treatment, no problems with erections, but you're leaking urine. Left. Strongly? No. Five-day treatment course, you have to travel to the hospital uh, and spend an hour there every day. Not now getting treatment, but just parking and getting checked in and all that. No pain. You may feel tired and need to take it easy for the first few weeks. One year after treatment, you have erections like you do today. Takes a year. Uh, on the right side, your doctors meet with you every six months. You need to get a biopsy every one to two years. You can do your normal activities. Your erections are much less frequent or firm uh, than they are today. Left. I have a question for this. It looks like the right side is an active surveillance and how the yeah. direction is going down in the this is, Yeah, so the, this is a, a, a complicated yeah. thing. It's, it it's, right? not, it's not, it, it, it's not uh, uh, an equal uh, uh, analysis. It is active that surveillance. Is ideal scenario, scenario for an active surveillance. Yes. And then... Well, people who get old, they, they lose erectile function. Uh, there's about a 5% uh, natural uh, loss of erectile function uh, uh, there. So now, based on this composite thing, for, for you, 
the most important thing was minimizing recovery time and treatment impact. The second most important thing for you was keeping urinary and sexual function. Slightly less important was bowel function. Living as long as possible did not seem that important to you. And uh, <laughs> because for you, the quality of life was as important as the quantity of life. And that's fair. Um, that is uh, fair. Uh, avoiding surgical complications uh, uh, was not uh, a big deal for you, you know, because the complications were self-limiting uh, and that was not an issue. And avoiding frequency urination uh, was not. And then they'll ask you, do these preferences show how you feel? So is it exactly right? Is it mostly right? Mostly right. So we'll just put that in. Uh, you know, and then it asks you if we can make the profile better. I mean, like the question that Dr. Tuari uh, asked, if I'm not having any treatment, how come my erections are going worse? You have not talked about partial gland treatment. Uh, you know, is that an option? These are things that you can ask. And when you see me and, uh, and Kashik, we will address this with you. And Marla, we will address it uh, there. So according to the personalized treatment fit, brachytherapy is the best option for you that will meet all your uh, uh, choices. External beam radiation is the second option. Uh, and surgery would be the third option. Uh, and you don't get this. Uh, I would get, uh, get this. Uh, and we talk about active surveillance. We talk about focal therapy at this point. Um, and since you said brachytherapy was the most important thing, I would spend more time talking with you about brachytherapy, radiation therapy. Uh, and then based on the discussion and showing the data, if your preferences change, I'll tailor the discussion uh, with that, to, to, to that. Um, download your prostate cancer report. And once you've done this, I will get a copy of this report. And it'll ask you a your typical question, how long did it take for you to do this? Or did you agree with the things? Um, and it thanks you. Um, <clears throat> so, your values, the highest concern was minimizing recovery time and treatment impact. And brachytherapy, uh, as Dr. Stewart said, you go in, it's an outpatient procedure, it's a one day procedure, and that will minimize your recovery time. Um, the least concern for you was avoiding surgical complications uh, and avoiding frequent urination. Uh, so uh, you might, after your discussion with me, decide that you are more comfortable with surgery once I tell you the great results that Dr. Tuari and Dr. Wickland have, uh, and you might feel that, that, uh, you know, that's, uh, um, that is there. And once again, it thanks you. Is that it? Okay. So now I'm going to play dirty pool. One of our panelists was brave enough to fill out uh, um, her, his uh, preference profile, and I'm going to show that uh, uh, to, uh, to you. And this panelist, the most important uh, thing for him was to avoid urination, uh, to live as long as possible, uh, sexual dysfunction, Bowel movements was not important. Uh, minimizing recovery time was not, and keeping urinary control um, was uh, uh, was not that uh, that important. Um, so he had perfect function coming in. He had no uh, no issues whatsoever. So in him, 
I would discuss surgery more because that fits his profile. Uh, if he wanted more questions, I'd talk what I knew about radiation therapy and I would send him to a radiation oncologist for a more in-depth discussion. I wouldn't talk about brachytherapy because that did not meet, uh, uh, meet his, uh, his profile. So if you came to see Dr. Tiwari and Dr. Tiwari felt that you needed more counseling, this is what we would go through. Uh, with, you, with you. I think it gave you a perspective as to how much of studies are going on in this field. It's not easy to make a decision. Things are important in terms of quality of life. Things are important in terms of longevity. And we really are very invested into active surveillance programs. So I'm going through a very structural change. You guys may get an emails from people who are on my active surveillance protocol that I may be seeing everyone once or twice a year and Dr. Menon may be seeing them more frequently and I'm recruiting more people because our active surveillance pool has gone to be about two, 3,000 patients. And then that every patient gets seen about three, four times a year, it becomes a large number. So I'm trying to organize that. We are developing some newer methods of uh, optimizing the nerve sparing. And there is a discussion about uh, partial gland treatment, and we have a discussion about, um, we are developing some newer methods of uh, delicately dissecting out the nerves so that in a right candidate, nine in 10 patient in one year can have the erections back. I mean, I think, so these are the things which we are trying to involve here. We are also working on immunotherapy. We just had our paper submitted today on the different immune mechanism as to how the prostate cancer can be tackled. So a lot of exciting things going on. I will have closure of today's session either by Bobby or, come on and you, Stuart. Bobby, you and Stuart both, uh, you have the final words to say. All right, save the best for last. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you know, I didn't have any like real prepared remarks just because I wasn't exactly sure what everyone was gonna talk about today. So this has kind of come a little bit off the cuff, but I'll, I'll kind of go back to something that I started off with when um, I, I, I kind of started, uh, at least like trying to get the session going is that there's, um, uh, I think it's, 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 it's kind of easy to kind of see it sometimes as like surgery versus radiation when we're actually kind of all on the same side. And um, I think one of the things that's become more and more important is for us to understand that there is a lot of multidisciplinary collaboration as it comes to prostate cancer management. And, um, you know, certainly here at Mount Sinai, we've, we've, we've kind of like started a lot of this a couple of years back and a lot of other institutions are of course like doing the same thing, but we're trying to make sure that, you know, anyone who is like newly diagnosed, um, you know, really gets like the breadth and the landscape of things that are out there and available for them. So, um, you know, I'll talk a little bit about our, our own efforts at like, you know, multidisciplinary prostate cancer clinic, uh, where we have the combined effort of like, like urologic surgeons, radiation oncology and medical oncology all in the same room, trying to make sure that people have like a good, like level load, like, you know, a good understanding of like, you know, all like the different intricacies of like, you know, like the pros and the cons, and all, at the same time, also trying to elicit a lot of like the patient preferences, a lot of their values and preferences that kind of tie into making these des decisions, because not everyone is kind of going to be cookie cutter. Not everyone's going to kind of favor the same plan. Different people have different disease, different people have different other medical problems. And, um, you know, different people have like different ideas of what they want for themselves as they come into the discussion. Um, so, you know, our, our, our own model multidisciplinary clinic is a little bit different than others. There's not like a, let's say like a standard model, but I would say that, you know, um, I think it's going to be an important facet of like, you know, prostate cancer going forward, mostly because while there's not been a standard model across the board, we've generally seen that there's been a couple of like, you know, important uh, benefits from like multidisciplinary kind of like consideration or view of cases. Uh, for one, you know, we definitely do see on the patient side of things that, you know, satisfaction is higher. There's like less risk of less concerns for like, you know, like treatment regret on the back end. Um, when we look at you know, like 
like overall outcomes, long-term outcomes, we also generally see that there is going to be in kind of an, at least like, well, uh, I'll say this with a grain of salt, but um, there's generally been like, you know, better overall long-term outcomes in terms of survival compared to what's typically seen in your kind of like our Sears database, which is kind of, you know, like the, the, the average sum total of like, you know, all prostate cancer management across like the U.S. Now that's a different, a difficult metric to prove only because like, you know, most of these multidisciplinary clinics live in more like, you know, high powered academic institutions where you have like, you know, hyper specialized specialists like, you know, Dr. Torrey, Dr. Vicklin, Dr. Stewart um, that are like, you know, really up, up to date on the most latest advances, making sure that we're treating people at the very least towards like, you know, current guidelines, which continues to evolve versus like, you know, when you end up seeing multiple different doctors who may not be kind of like, super, like really specialized in that field, you might get like recommendations are perhaps a little bit dated. And that's often what causes a little bit of conflict. Um, and I would say like, um, there are one of the big benefits tends to be surrounding things like locally advanced prostate cancer, where indeed there has to be a collaboration between surgery, radiation, and medical oncology, because there has to be some multimodality in involve, involvement. And we see like an you know, improvements in outcomes specifically in, in that type of scenario, but similar to kind of what Dr. Torrey was talking about, like a lot of times, like we do want to make sure that we're showing a united front that active surveillance is a good option. And we see a more adoption of active surveillance and people who go through like multidisciplinary like cancer clinics. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a nice environment to get a lot of questions answered quickly, thoroughly. It also, cause everyone's in the same room, it kind of keeps us honest. We can't, you know, like, you know, slightly spin things to kind of make things sound better to make, make us like, you know, sound like this is a better option than that one. It's, it's, I think it's like a nice environment to get a lot of like things like, you know, done. And um, I think, you know, patient satisfaction shows in this because, you know, there's a lot of the studies have already been showing that, you know, people who come to a multi clinic in order to kind of review all their options, either for like their primary opinion or even for a secondary opinion, we know that that satisfaction level is high because we see a significant improvement, um, a significant number of people that will stay at that institution where the multidisciplinary can cancer clinic was run for their next leg of like, their treatment. So, um, of course, like, you know, uh, we, that's going to be something that, you know, we continue to like, kind of innovate and try to like, you know, figure out how to bring together outside of like, you know, like a multidisciplinary like, clinic, you know, we still have our, like almost all cancer centers will have their multidisciplinary prostate cancer, like a tumor board, um, things where like everyone else kind of also has some input. But here you, we have like a direct like face-to-face -face contact with the Basically patient. Basically have a one room with three doctors sitting at the same time. And then those of you who have attended. But let's convert this into, yeah. now is the question time. Because any one of you has a question, this is the time to ask, please. 